The fiscal cliff specifically is one of the major ways in which the slow recovery that we have could be completely derailed. You know, hard landing in China, uh, euro collapsing, problems in the Middle East, and fiscal cliff is probably paramount in, those, in that area. A stern warning and a plea for sanity from the most powerful man on Wall Street. Moments ago in the halftime report, Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein telling CNBC's Steve Leisman that unless Washington gets its act together and avoids the fiscal cliff, Main Street and the rest of the world will suffer. I'm Jackie DeAngelis and welcome to a special edition of Futures Now. Let's bring in the crew in Chicago on the floor of the CME, the world's largest exchange, a 20-year veteran of the Pitts, Rich L. Chisholm, and of course at the NYMEX, home of the crude, Anthony Grisanti. Guys, riveting stuff from Blank Fine. Rich, what's the reaction from the floor? Jackie D, they got to do something. They got to do it now. The problem is coming into an election, the chances of anybody with Stone stepping in and, and making a, a call or, or, or fixing our problem is probably nil. We're going to have to wait until after the election. That's the word down here. Well, not a lot of time, of course, to go. I want to get reaction, though, from Washington as well on what we just heard. Let's bring in Representative Ron Paul of Texas. Representative Paul, great to have you on Futures Now. You heard Mr. Blankfein. Do you think the fact that Wall Street now is pushing for a solution, too, is going to help us avoid the fiscal cliff? Well, it, it might, but it might not be all that relevant. Politicians do what politicians always do. They, they always delay their decisions to the last minute. They're always looking uh, for an opportunity to blame the other side, but they always do something that is not permanent. It's always temporary. If, if you're looking for what might happen at the end of the year, just look at last summer when they had to deal with the raising of the national debt. They went to the last minute, and then they sort of delayed it for a year, and they're still fussing about that. So they're not going to allow all those terrible things to happen on January 1st, but they're going to not solve the problem either. So it's going to be more uncertainty. So I wouldn't expect any good news, but I don't think you uh, should expect that all those horrible tax increases <laughs> are going to occur in January. Somebody, I mean, when, when time comes where everybody panics, whether it's a bailing out of all the banks and everybody else, Congress acts, the Fed acts, everybody does what they have to do to delay the inevitable, and that is uh, live up to the two facts that government living way beyond its means is ought to cut spending. If they're not willing to do that, they're, so they're going to just delay it the best they can. Representative Paul, it's uh, Anthony Grisanti here. You know, we, everybody's been mentioning the fiscal cliff. Even my mom's mentioned it at this <laughs> point, and you said they're going to push it off till the end. But uh, do you think they'll take a shot with the spending cuts at this point and make those uh, and let those happen, uh, even though you say they'll kick down the, the can of the road on the tax cuts? Well, you know, they might pretend and they might call them, uh, uh, you know, cuts in spending, but even the proposed cuts aren't cuts. All they're talking about is this, uh, how do you deceive the people further with this baseline budgeting? So they, pro you know, the Democrats propose to have the increases of $2 trillion, and Republicans say, well, let's cut 10%, and people who yell and scream, you can't cut that much. So even the cuts aren't cut, they're just cutting on the proposed increases. And that's how far removed they are from reality, because I think you have to cut something. I think we have to change policy. I think we have to address foreign policy. I think we have to address domestic welfare policy. And there's no indication that this campaign that we're involved in right now, they're even discussing that. The people aren't ready for it. So all they're ready for is who's going to get blamed, which party's going to get blamed, and what the delay is going to look like. And that is why there's uncertainty, and that is why this recession has been going on, and that's why it's going to last a lot longer, because they will not resolve it, because they must cut spending, and there's not much of a chance of that happening. Representative Paul, this is Rich in Chicago at the CME. Guys here are, are angry, and, and let me ask you something. Do you think there's any legs to the stories as we come into election that there's a little bit of manipulation with the unemployment rate dropping <laughs> below 8%, and the un infinite QE that uh, Bernanke uh, is giving us, which we know you don't like, and the concept that traders are saying, if oil gets above 100 bucks, there's going to be an SPR release, in, in, you know, in, in effect, before an election, that we're kind of smoothing the gate for Obama. And, and if so, uh, well, I'll let you answer that, but I have a follow-up question. 
Well, sure there's manipulation. That's been going on forever. I, 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 one poll that I'd like to see run someday is go out and talk to 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 average Americans and ask him, them how many believe what their government tells them on anything, whether it's why we go to war or why we have to print money or why we have to bail somebody out or how bad things are. I, w- I would think 80% of the people would say... Well, maybe on occasion they tell the truth, but we really don't trust the government on what they say. <laughs> but I think what government, they've, they've been fudging figures for a long, long time. You know, the very first thing that uh, Bernanke did in 06 when he took over was he got rid of the reporting of uh, M- M3 because it wasn't revealing, you know, information that he wanted to be revealed. When I asked him why he did that, he said, well, we have to save money. It costs a lot of money to give us that statistic. So the goal of politicians is to spin. The difference between conspiracy to contrive numbers versus spin, you know, the line is pretty fuzzy there. But the whole thing is is to deceive the people further. Right now, you know, unemployment is going down. Everything is, everybody's supposed to feel wonderful, and yet we still have probably 20 million people unemployed. And, uh, but they won't face up to the truth, and I think that this, this fudging of figures will continue. It will get worse. If you look at history, the bigger the government, the more bureaucratic it is, the more likely they'll make mistakes, but the more likely it is that they'll deceive us with uh, deliberately fudging the figures. So I think it's a mixture of all those things. Well, Congressman, you bring up a great point, and my next question is a perfect follow-on of that. Jack Welch, the former boss here at GE, our former parent company, he recently tweeted, he said that those jobs numbers last week were cooked. We also got some good jobs claims this morning for the week. So I want to ask you, do you believe that the improving jobs data what we're seeing right now, do you think this is real progress? No, not really. I mean, maybe temporary blips for various different reasons, but I think it's it's more the way they spin this, and I think there is that effort, but you can't get away with that for so long. I mean, what if they, what if they can spin numbers and deceive the people up until election day? Uh, the, the unemployment problems are still there. You know, there's still this, this uh, threat of another downturn, and I think uh, that's inevitable. So, uh, well, Representative no, you Paul, do you agree? Do you time. agree with Mr. Welch? Then the books were cooked in that situation. Well, I, I, I think I don't think uh, I wouldn't have used those words, but I think that is I wouldn't argue with him either. Right. I, I, I don't think you know the ten people sat together and and said this is what we're going to do. But the figures aren't realistic, but I don't think figures are hardly ever realistic. I mean, uh, there, there's always deception in it. And politicians, I mean, just think of what happens in these debates. I mean, do you really get hard evidence of what's going on or what people believe or what the future will hold? No, it's, it's a negative to be forthright and truthful. And that's why people uh, that have to make these business decisions, the people who are in the marketplace, I don't know how they survive all this. What are they, what are they going to believe? And well, if, we, if we have somebody, oh, we're going to lower your taxes next year, nobody's going to believe that. And, and uh, they hope it will happen, but they, there's not enough confidence in government, and the government doesn't deserve the confidence. Well, that's an excellent point, especially as we wait for that vice presidential debate this evening. But, Representative Paul, let's turn to the larger election. Now, we recently had legendary investor Jim Rogers on Futures Now. He was down on both of the candidates. Listen to what he had to say. It doesn't matter, Jackie, whether it's Romney or Obama. They're both the, they're both the same. They're no, they don't know or have a clue what's going on. They caused the problems. These are the guys that caused, got us into this situation. Right, right. You, okay. you think they're going to get us out? All right, so two questions for you, Representative Paul. One, do you agree with what Mr. Rogers said? And two, are you ready to endorse Mitt Romney? No to the second. Uh, and, uh, yes, I agree with uh, Jimmy Rogers. He, he knows exactly what he's uh, he, he's talking about, but he he emphasizes the ignorance of the two when it comes to economic policy. There, that's uh, you know uh, uh, something I would agree with, but that isn't exactly the way I look at it. I look at it that there are people who are very very powerful that are able to make sure their interests are protected, whether it's the people who run the Federal Reserve and bail out banks and bail out European banks and international situation. Right now, they have their two guys there. 
believe me. Can you? Why? Why does uh, Obama not attack Romney for being the Goldman Sachs candidate? It's because they both they both are within the establishment where they need the Federal Reserve and the lender of last resort to make sure that you can take all the risk in the world, but don't sweat it because government will be there and the Fed will be there, and they're going to get bailed out. So uh, I think the two guys are there. He could. Jimmy can argue they don't really understand it. Economics, in, a, in many ways, that's true because neither one of them have the vaguest idea of what Austrian free markets, hard money economics is all about. But at the same time, they know how to play the game and they represent a one party system. Somebody said, Why don't we get a third party? And another one said, and I think correctly so, why don't we get a second party? <laughs> you know, compete with this single party. I mean, I've been in this business a long time, and be- believe me, there is essentially no difference from one administration to another, no matter what the platforms. Wow, say. that's that's a really substantial statement to make to say that there would be no difference if Mitt Romney took over in the White House. Now, given a lot of what I've read about you, Re- Representative Paul, some of the quotes that I've heard about you, I just want to quote off your website. You recently wrote that the government doesn't create resources when it's taxing people; it's printing money. It merely redistributes wealth while supporting massive, wasteful bureaucracy along the way. If that's how you feel, you don't feel that Mitt Romney can offer some solutions? Well, you know, I think he wants to. I think he leans in that direction. But it's sort of like listening to George Bush Sr. No new taxes. I will not raise taxes. And he raises taxes. Somebody else runs and George Bush Jr. runs on, well, you know, let's have a humble foreign policy and let's have a different foreign policy. And he starts more war. Then we elect Obama for the same reason. Well, maybe he will have a different foreign policy. The foreign policy stays the same. The monetary policy stays the same. There's no proposal for any real cuts, and both parties support it. So what's going to happen yeah, it is say Republicans win everything. The orders will come down. I was there when the Bush administration was there. The orders would come down, and even the conservatives rolled over, did whatever they were told, you know, by the Republican president. And nobody's arguing the case that Mitt Romney represents the conservative wing of the Republican Party. Okay. I mean, he's All able right. to say some things that uh, appeal to him, and he hopes that he gets their vote. But uh, he's really not, you know, a conservative. So you're maintaining your stance that no matter what happens, who comes into the White House this November, we're going to see much of the same. One more question before I let you go, Representative Paul. Just want to ask you, where do you see gold going? Mm -hmm. Well, it always goes up, but don't ask me which day. And the dollar (laughs) always goes down, and uh, it's been going down for a long, long time. And if you look at the past 10 years, gold's been up every year, and it looks like this year it's going back up again. So it isn't so much that gold goes up. Uh, I look at the dollar. We print money like never before. We live in historic times. There has never been a worldwide fiat currency involved in global economies like they are today. And uh, we have somebody managing that is the biggest inflation person ever to uh, have that position. And Bernanke says whatever is necessary, he's going to do it. If QE3 doesn't work, eternity with QEs are going to happen. He will destroy the, pro- the dollar if we don't come to our senses and cut, really cut, spending and live within our means. Okay, so that's what it comes down to, cutting that spending and keeping hold and, of course, letting the dollar uh, stay, hopefully, and, and appreciate. Our thanks, of course, to Representative Ron Paul. Enough talk, guys. Grizz, make me some money. We talked about the fiscal cliff. What are you doing here? Yeah, Jackie, it's, it, it is about the fiscal cliff. It's about what's beyond that, our budget problems. You know, the, the numbers have been coming out for analyst estimates on, on earnings things like that. Looking forward, they look bad. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on right here. And, and when I look at Walmart and Costco making all-time highs, the consumer's still worried, in my eyes, about this economy. They're still looking for bargains. They're still looking not to spend money. So I want to short the E-mini S&P. I'm going to short it uh, right above these numbers right now at 1440. I'm going to put in my stop up above that at 1459. And I'm looking for a correction in the equities market down to 13 or in the market, but I'm looking for the S&P to correct down to 1390. Listen, I think we had our little correction. The trend line's still uh, intact, Anthony. And listen, we see a little bit of a bid in here, even with all this bad news. And as uh, a Representative Paul said, they'll probably keep pushing this down the road. This physical cliff is not going to be something that's addressed here in the next couple of weeks. I don't think the stock market actually has that big correction. Maybe you're looking for quite yet. All right. Rich analyst estimates and looking forward. 
Okay, so we're looking for a correction here. Anthony, of course, let's recap your trade. If you want to side with Grizz and you're looking for the S&P to go lower, let's take a look at what's at stake. He is, of course, looking um, for... He is, his trade is looking to sell at 1440. His target is 1390. It's a 50 point move lower from his entry point. So each dollar move equals 50 bucks of risk. Remember that. Basically, he's hoping to make a $2,500 move there, and he's risking 950 to do it. 